Hello everyone, we are the senior design team in charge of researching the development of a firefighting robot. My name is Alan Lennon and before we dive into the research, I'd like to get into the background of the problem that we're trying to solve. Did you know that over a five year sample period, 354,400 home structure fires burn down a year? That totals up to a $6.9 billion in property damage. Now, when firefighters arrive on the scene, they have multiple tasks, including rescue, limiting exposure, confinement, and extinguishment, and that's only during the fire. So the objective with our project is to develop a robot that will help in fire suppression, cleanup overall, communication, gas detection, local area mapping using LIDAR, thermal imaging so we can tell the hot spots of the fire, having the robot be modular so we can input different subsystems according to the needs of the fire department and develop a robot that's cost efficient comparatively speaking to the robots that are currently out in the field. For our robot, we aim to impact society by allowing firefighters to allocate resources to other objectives such as rescue or extinguishment rather than suppressing fire. We hope to help prevent 2,560 civilian fire deaths per year. We also hope to limit property damage and as well as modernize firefighting such as the robot that has been implemented today by our own Los Angeles Fire Department. So starting off with the chassis, we decided to choose the 4130 alloy steel using the form factor of one and a quarter by three quarters tall square tubing. And the reason we chose it is because it has a really high hardness so it's able to be robust and it's more cost efficient when it comes to comparing with aluminum alloys. The high tensile and yield strength of the material will allow the chassis to handle varying loads while it's servicing in the field. So here we see the finite element analysis done on the chassis for total deformation. Um, if we can see on the red area that that's where the most information will be concentrated and we can see by the scale put on on the left that at most we'll have a deformation of 0.3 millimeters at maximum deformation. The applied load on the chassis was about 150 pounds which will roughly simulate the container that will be used placed on the back of the robot as well as the deck gun placed on top of the robot which are the heaviest components. A total stress and total strain analysis was also done on the chassis. That finite element analysis can be found on the final report of the robot. Onto the body panels, the material that we decided to go with was 1020 mild steel cold rolled, which is pretty industry standard and it's able to be machinable more than aluminum, its aluminum counterparts, as well as be able to provide a decent cost reduction comparatively speaking to aluminum again. The form factor that we plan to use for the sheet metal would be an 18 gauge steel, which is pretty standard. Um, the tensile strength and yield strength while not being as hard and as tough as the 4130 steel alloy, it will still be able to provide the robot with pretty heavy duty protection against outside or external forces. And now we'll pass it to Jason Negret, who will be discussing his research on the deck gun and piping system. Hi, I am Jason Negrete, and I will be discussing about the deck gun, its piping system, as well as the cooling system for the robot. The Streammaster 2 is the best deck gun on the market that brings an integrated ball bell to be able to control the flow of the water between a jet stream and flat stream. It has a total weight of 62.1 pounds with a flow rate of 2,000 gallons per minute and a maximum pressure of 250 psi. The gun has a vertical travel of 120 degrees upwards and 45 degrees downwards with a horizontal travel of 355 degrees. It also comes with 90 degrees discharge valve that a fire hose can be attached to when the deck gun isn't really being used. Now for the piping system of the deck gun, we needed to find a metal piping material that can withstand a pressure of 275 PSI. 
This is due to the reason that a two and a half inch supply hose has a maximum operating pressure of 275 PSI. Therefore, it was decided that we would use 304 stainless steel since it has an excellent resistance to corrosion and rust. The pipes and 90 degrees elbows that are going to be used will withstand a maximum pressure of 300 PSI. Then a two-way valve is going to be connected to the piping to be able to attach two supply hoses. That way more water is supplied to the robot quicker. Due to the extreme heats the firefighting robot will be exposed to, overheating can become a severe problem. Severe heating can damage the internal systems found within the robot, which in the worst case scenario can cause a fire. This can cause precious time to take down a fire, since it forces the robot to shut down. For that reason, having a cooling system for the robot is a priority. There are many types of cooling systems that can be designed into a robot, but for function purpose and cost management, a ventilation and fan cooling system will be used. We know that we have to find a way to cool down an approximate volume of 220 cubic inches within the robot. So we put six vents in front of the robot. Each vent has an opening of half an inch with eight inches wide to let sufficient air to flow in. Then in the back of the robot, we added another five vents with half an inch opening and 13 inches wide to let the air flow out. We are also going to add three cooling fans to help draw out the hot air from within the robot. The water running through the piping of the deck gun will also help dissipate the heat to keep the robot cool. Having this type of system will also take weight off the robot making it lighter. Hello everyone, my name is Brian Hernandez and I will be talking about the analysis done for the insulations. One of the quick assumptions that helped simplify the analysis was assuming that our robot was a perfect cube as seen on the image to the right. We then used uh, the heat equation that used total thermal resistance. This helped us combine all of the thermal conductivities that we were going to use into one value to further our analysis. As we can see, uh, the values taken into account, or the thermal conductivities taken into account, are a paint coating that we will be using, a uh, similar paint coating that they use for the grills, uh, as well as the thermal conductivity of the metal that we will be using, the metal sheets surrounding the robot. Uh, and then we came up with two types of insulators that we will be taking into account. Uh, below we have some quick analysis of the thermal conductivities as well as their densities and their prices that will be discussed later on in the report. Further analysis that I performed on the robot were finding the center of mass of our robot. Uh, this was done to help find the equilibrium of our robot to ensure that it wouldn't tip over uh, as well as the moments where they were concentrated again to ensure that the robot move with ease and it wouldn't tip over and there wouldn't be any issues. Now from the image on the left uh, we can see that the analysis this is the side view of a robot. The analysis was done from the back of the robot moving forward in the X direction, positive X direction, where theoretical center of masses of major components were taken into account. Now these were just assumptions. Um, we don't really know that the mass is concentrated at the center of each of these components, uh, the battery, the container, motor, or the gun. Uh, so further research would need to be done uh, for future classes to ensure that the center of mass is precise. So continuing with the center of mass, the same analysis was performed uh, in what I assume to be the Y direction as well as the C direction as seen on the image on the left. 
Um, one quick, uh, I guess something I noticed was that if everything is centered uh, in the y direction, the center of mass should be right down the middle. Uh, if the motor, the battery, the container, and the water gun are basically centered. Uh, so to help with the analysis and the computations, uh, a code I wrote a code in MATLAB where I use matrices uh, to find the sum of the multiplication between the masses and their distances uh, and from the back of the robot to moving forward uh, in the x-direction uh, this was just done to help basically just in the event that you know we decide to take certain things out or add more masses um, easier computations can be done and manipulated to help get calculations quicker continuing with the center of mass analysis that I am currently working on is a robot being able to go up and down stairs without tipping now we've gathered that the angle of stairs ranges between 30 and 50 degrees in my analysis I'm currently using 45 degrees to help with computations uh, or to help facilitate computations but so far what I've attained from the computations is that if the deck gun is placed too far in front of the robot when the robot goes downstairs it may tip over or it may tip forward due to the uh, amount of moments being concentrated at the very front of a robot and now I will pass it on to the electrical engineers uh, to Lily Beth this presentation will be about the 3 volt non-contact iron temperature sensor model number MLX90614 BSF things to be covered in this presentation shall be the sensors wiring the implementation of SM bus communication what happens when processing object temperature the results from my research and lastly to talk about any further research to begin with, in the following figure, demonstrates wiring connections for the sensor. The circuit was complete with a 16 by 2 LCD display and a microcontroller called PSOC 5LP. There are two wire communication pins, SCLK and SDA, at pins 1 and 2 of the sensor. Inner integrated circuit I squared C is a process of sending data one bit at a time through a communications channel. This sensor uses a two wire protocol SDA and SCLK. This feature is called SM bus that defines a two wire bus for the purpose of communication. SM bus meaning system management bus uses signal signaling abbreviated act and NACT, which means to acknowledge or not acknowledge the following is a flowchart that explains the operation of the sda and sclk pins in sm bus communication after, after every received eight bits the slave device should issue act or NACT. to begin with when a PSOC 5LP initiates communication, it first writes the address of the slave and only the slave device which recognizes the address will act. In the case the slave device NACs one of the bytes, the master device should stop communication and repeat the message. If ACT Communication reads the command address and decides whether ACT or NACT once again. If ACT occurs, communication continues to read the slave address in a read bit. 
Overall, the system is managed by ACT and NAC and will continue to read and write only to there are no errors. Processing object temperature from the IR sensor is done by the internal DSP, which produces digital outputs. First, we would have to convert the hex value to a decimal value. Then, we would multiply it by 0 0.02 degrees Celsius to get the unit Kelvin temperature. And then, we would need to convert the Kelvin temperature into Celsius, and we will have the ideal object temperature. Due to an error in wiring, my results are inconclusive. I spoke with the team advisor who applied the correct wiring and made sure the embedded code was correct with him as well. In future studies, I would recommend a long range sensor in the front of the robot in reading object temperatures. If we want a sensor to detect temperatures at a distance, then range should be implemented. This gives the robot more ability to detect hotspots. After detection of dangerous temperatures that may be damaging to electrical components, this sensor should have an alert system that triggers to cool itself down with possible water spouts. Hi everyone, and my name is Brian Nunez, and I will be speaking to you about our choice of contact temperature sensor rather than the contactless sensor as Louis has spoken about. Uh, the main reason for choosing this type of uh, sensor is to get a temperature reading from within our robot. Uh, as you can see on the right, uh, the hole allows us to connect it to a screw or uh, anywhere that's possible uh, with that metal. One example would be reading the temperature of our batteries or we can also, as I said before, just stick them all around inside the body uh, to make sure that the robot is still in a working temperature environment. Uh, they're very cost efficient, about less than $3 uh, per unit. Uh, and they are also, we chose this in particular because of the specs of ranging from negative 50 to 150 degrees Celsius. Uh, those are the ranges of what most of our sensors will su survive. If that robot were to get above this 150 degrees Celsius, uh, we'd most likely have a robot that uh, could not function due to the electronics dying. Uh, so having these sensors could be useful in order to keep the robot out of danger. Uh, with that being said, I would like to speak about our testing methodology of this sensor in particular. Uh, so in order to calculate what was happening, uh, we plotted and got results from our voltages and our th uh, thermometer probe that we had at hand. Uh, what we did was plot this in Excel and we got uh, an equation that we could plug into our, our code. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this did not end up resulting in a good uh, calculation. Uh, we were getting about a four to six degree error within of our professional temperature probe. After that, uh, we did ran the test three more times. Uh, we took the average of the uh, the graphs, and we plotted a cubic equation uh, in MATLAB. Uh, this was due to data sheet saying it was an S-shaped curve. Uh, as you can see on the left, uh, those were all the points that we were receiving off of our experiments. Uh, unfortunately, due to uh, not having a laboratory. Uh, I was only able to use what uh, I had in hand. Uh, so in reality, if we were to zoom out, of course, our temperature reaches from 150 degrees to negative 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, we imagine this curve to be along this line of sorts. Uh, of course, uh, in a laboratory setting, we would be able to uh, plot more points to see and to make sure our code was correct. And the results of that were placed on an LCD screen. Uh, on the far right, you can see uh, both temperatures in Celsius and Fahrenheit. Uh, that's a simple calculation. Uh, voltages on the left, just for debugging purposes, just in case the equations were not uh, matching the temperature probe. Uh, with that being said, uh, that is the end of my contact sen sensor. Uh, but we do want to start thinking about the future and how we would start to implement this with uh, 
other ways of displaying this data. Uh, as you have seen so far and will continue to see throughout this presentation, the EE students were all using an LCD screen to display their data. Uh, with that being said, with our understanding of I2C, uh, we could connect a Raspberry Pi and our PSOC that controls all the sensors, and we can use that Raspberry Pi to actually display the data to the firefighters. So initially we just wanted to make sure that we can connect both boards together without an issue. Uh, that resulted in quite simple scripts that the Pi has. Uh, we were able to see the addresses of our Pi or PSOC and get information from that. Uh, due to some debugging uh, on the far right, we can see some programs that we were using to see the data that was communicating between both boards. But that resulted in a very simple way to do it. So we started to uh, think about how we can do more with this. Uh, we were getting correct data. Uh, now was to make a simple script to get that updated information. And this was our result. We created a simple script. We saw the results. Uh, unfortunately, if we zoom into the results, uh, we were getting errors uh, in this particular time uh, this the temperature was at 31 degrees but we get varying results from 0 to 48 degrees Celsius uh, so this was the bad results uh, fortunately for us we were using that debugging uh, thing as spoken before and we were resulted in much better values were the correct ones uh, unfortunately as you see towards the middle uh, we did get a zero which uh, should not have been there uh, but as we continue this project uh, we hope for this to get better and more ways to resolve this issue and with that uh, I will hand it off to Braulio which he will explain more about our Raspberry Pi. Hello um, I'm Braulio and in this section I'll be discussing about how a robot will be communicating back to a chosen operating device. Uh, firstly, the way we established a live video feed is by gathering both a camera and the and the main microcontroller. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 4 Model B was the main microcontroller used, and the Raspberry Pi camera, a 5 megapixel 1080p camera module, was the camera used. Uh, upon choosing these components, we took into consideration the resolution, sample rate, compatibility between the devices, and cost, and determined that these were the best choices for the project. Uh, in the block diagram below, we could view in a simple way how the devices are connected. Uh, as you can note, communication between the Raspberry Pi and the operating device uh, was established over Wi-Fi, and both devices were on the same local network. Um, next slide, please. Um, in our design, we decided to implement a co-processor, uh, that way alleviating the Raspberry Pi from handling all the sensors. And we chose the PSOC 5LP, as we mentioned in some previous slides before. And we did that partly because it was inexpensive. Uh, the PSOC 5LP microcontroller was responsible for collecting all sensor data. Um, it is connected to the Raspberry Pi via I2C, and it passes on desired data for further processing. Uh, in terms of the code to make our design work, we have a Python script running on the Raspberry Pi for the image stream sensor data processing and transmission to the operating device. Uh, the PSOC was configured with all sensors using PSOC creator and uh, C code. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, once implementing everything, we successfully managed to create a user interface. Uh, amongst what was accomplished was an image stream with real-time sensor data uh, overlaid on the video uh, from the PSOC microcontroller. Uh, a frame rate from the image stream averaging about 10 frames per second and the resolution of 680 by 420p. Uh, further improvements and future goals include having a longer transmission range, uh, thermal mapping, uh, faster frame rate, and uh, of course, a friendlier user interface with additional data. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, here's just uh, an image. Uh, you could see the result of the interface. Uh, the sensor data is displayed up top so that it doesn't obscure the image too much. And this is the outcome and the data changes in real time along with the image. And uh, uh, now I'm going to pass it on to uh, Christopher. Thank you, Braulio. 
Hi, I'm Chris Panita, and I'll be talking about the gas detection system for our firefighting robot. For this, we decided to go with the MQ-2 gas sensor, as this is capable of detecting a variety of flammable gases. These gases include hydrogen, methane, propane, and liquefied petroleum gas. This sensor is also very low cost. On the right hand side, you can see this chart that was provided in the sensor's data sheet, which relates the concentration in PPM of a detected gas versus the resistance ratio between the gas being flammable versus the clean air. On the bottom right, you can see this linear equation that we were able to extract from this chart, which allowed us to calculate the concentration of the gas. So this gas outputs a analog signal, which we connect to the PSOX analog to digital converter, allowing us to easily calculate the concentration of any flammable gases using the equation that was on the previous slide. For testing, we use a handheld lighter that would display on an LCD screen whether a detected gas is above a predefined threshold. And if that concentration is above the threshold, it would let us know on the LCD screen and turn on an LED and sound a buzzer. And because this sensor can't detect, I'd correctly identify which gas is being detected, we would need to loop through each of the different e equations for each of the gases to de decide which concentration it was detecting. Now I'll be talking about the lighting system. For the lighting system for our fighter fighting robot, we decided to go with 22 watt LED light pods. As these light pods are mainly used on our floating vehicles, so they can pre assembled and are very durable. They also output 1600 lumens. They're low cost at about $30 a pair. They're very low maintenance something that's big for firefighters as they don't have the time to be diagnosing why the light pods aren't turning on. They also have 50,000 hour lifetime, so they'll last a very long time. And we would have these located on the front left and front right of our robot. And now I will hand it over to Rocio. Thank you, Chris. My name is Rocio Espinal and I'll be talking about the water pressure sensor. The sensor can be used in liquid and non-corrosive gases which are gases that are in the air, such as nitrogen. The working pressure range for the sensor is from 0 to 1.2 megapascals. The sensor does have a limitation, and the limitation will be at a max 2.4 megapascals pressure. Anything other than that can severely damage the sensor or can destroy the sensor. The temperature range from negative 4 degrees to 221 degrees Fahrenheit. From the picture to your left, you will see that's the sensor that was used. And the pictures on the right will show the complete wiring and configure of the sensor with the PSOC and the LCD. The picture to your bottom corner on this right will be a display of zero pressure at the moment that the sensor detected. The sensor has three main connections. The black wire will be for ground. The red wire will be for voltage and the yellow wire will be for the output as you can see from the picture to your left. From the picture to your right will be the configuration with the PSOC, two components, the LCD, and an ADC converter which stands for translating analog signals such as temperature, pressure in this case, into a digital representation or a digital signal that was later displayed in the LCD. <coughs> I will be talking about the motors. The motors are wheelchair motors. Um, they come in pair, the left and the right motor. They're right angle gears, and they already have installed encoders. And the quarters is important because it's a method of controlling the rotation by detecting the motor speed rotation and the rotation of angle. Using the encoders is also known as a feedback control or a closed loop method. These motors are great for heavy duty motor, uh, robots 
they have been used by the company that creates them into several of their projects and several heavy duty robots. The rating power for the motors are at 320, 320 watts. The voltage will be at 24 BDC and the output speed will be at 120 RPM. The project had a requirement and the requirement was to go up a lap, the stairs at five miles per hour at a 30% rate. The robot weight was at 350 and multiplying the speed going up the incline by the weight of the robot, we have a result of 700 watt motors that was required for this project. Although our motors are less than 700 watts, we do believe that going up the stairs at a reduced speed will be enough for the robot to be able to perform the task. Hello, my name is Marco Lopez. I'm in charge of researching and testing for the LiDAR sensor for our firefighting robot. The LiDAR sensor, as shown in figure two, is a sensor that emits and receives light and will give you the distance based on the time it takes to emit and receive. I used I squared C and LCD and a PSOC board in order to build, program, and display my results. For the following program, I used I squared C with the help of our advisor to check the distance and store it in buffer zero and buffer one and display the results. Some of the results I received are as follows. For the first value I received, I placed a LIDAR, the LiDAR half a foot from the prop and it read 15 centimeters and a half a foot is roughly 15.24 centimeters. For the second value, I received 30 centimeters, which is about one foot from the prop. Finally, 63 centimeters, which is slightly over two feet, even though it was only two feet away. However, this could be chalked up to human error or mispositioning on my part. Overall, the tests are showing mostly accurate measurements. For this attempt, I placed the LiDAR sensor on the edge of the prop, as shown in the picture on the left, this causes the LiDAR to display the distance from behind the prop. However, it would go back and forth quickly uh, between 5.1 feet, which is the 160 centimeters displayed, and two feet, which was the 60 centimeters from the prop. This is explained earlier in the code because it will store the, on one side it will store the buffer zero, which is the distance from the prop, and the buffer one, which is the distance behind. And because it's in between, it will constantly switch between the two distances. Finally, this is a short display of how the sensor works in real time. I moved the sensors between 1 to 1.6 feet, which displays 34 to 48 centimeters. This accuracy is very critical to the robot because needing to take into account your surroundings and any possible debris in the field will allow the operator to make better decisions based on the space the robot has to maneuver. For the future, hopefully, the future engineers who work on this will have uh, will find a better, more heat resistant and longer range sensor. So this it works to its highest potential. Thank you. And I'll hand it over to Brian to talk about the RC controller and receiver. My name is Brian Casillas and I'll be going over the RC controller and receiver. So the controller and receiver connect to each other wirelessly. The receiver outputs PWM signals on all eight channels and these signals go through our PSOC microcontroller. So the way our PSOC handles these signals is by using timers. So what a timer does is it takes a PWM signal and measures the pulse width of that signal. With this value, we can control the speed of motors in our robot. So for example, we can control the speed of a motor that controls the throttle, or maybe the, a motor that controls the steering of the robot, or anything else. Uh, our operating voltage on the receiver is 5 volts, but we can use anywhere between 4.8 to 10 volts for the receiver. Here, we're demonstrating channel 3. You'll see when I push up the stick, the pulse width increases, and if I push it down, it decreases. And you'll also see next to 3, there's a letter. D is for drive, N is for neutral, and R is for reverse. So channel three is for controlling the throttle of the robot. Other channels will be controlling other things for the robot. So for example, channel one will be controlling the steering of the robot left and right, or perhaps channel seven 
which is a switch, will be controlling the two-way nozzle control, which can switch the nozzle from flat to jet or vice versa. This is our current progress for our senior design project. While this project is by no means complete, we have a great amount of information that can be used with future teams for our projects. We went out and asked real firefighters for their feedback on how a robot would benefit them if it was built in a particular way. For example, firefighters told us this robot needed to be built tough, and it needed to be a robot that could really take a beating. Furthermore, we were told that the robot should interface with the firefighter's large hose. This is a must. The robot should be able to detect gases so that it can keep firefighters away from a possible catastrophic event, such as an exploding building. Firefighters also mentioned about including a radio repeater system that could be very helpful. We weren't able to do it with the budget we had, but future teams can be able to do this. All of our electrical engineers worked with different sensors and generated code so that very fundamental electrical parts of the robot can function, uh, such as the RC control, gas sensing, um, motor movement, etc. With that, Future teams can use this information to further improve the systems we had built and possibly iron out some issues we had with the hardware. We also gave a list of items that would fit our current budget. We also have a list of items that would be most appropriate if the robot was to be completely built by future teams. One of our goals was to provide substantial information to the future teams so that the robot can be built within four years time. But we believe that the progress our team has made is an excellent starting point on how we want our final complete robot to be in the far future. Any questions? Thank you and have a great rest of your day.